Today we have a really interesting panel. It will be led by Joe Henyu, CEO of Triple Ring, co-founder, I believe, 16 or so years at Triple Ring, doing great things in the industry and a really important sponsor of this event and have been with us from day one. So I want to thank Joe and his team for supporting this event. It doesn't happen without you. Um, this, the subject today is the Venture Studio, a new model for improving med tech and life science startups. I'm going to let Joe take it from here, and let's please welcome this panel. Well, thank you, Scott, and uh, thank you for getting us kicked off precisely at 117. That's uh, <laughs> uh, amazing precision. Yeah, we appreciate the precision. So, um, the topic of this panel is uh, venture studios and uh, similar models to make uh, startup development more efficient. And that's a topic that's very dear to me at Triple Ring. We're a co-development firm that partners with innovators and entrepreneurs to solve problems, develop new products, and launch new companies. Uh, importantly, we try to do that very much in a partnership model where we're sharing some risk and reward. And a big part of that is uh, trying to make sure that the process is efficient. Uh, I also think this topic is very timely right now because uh, coming uh, out of, into the pandemic and through the pandemic, somewhat counterintuitively, we've just seen an enormous level of activity with life science and med tech startups. So there's a real need, a pressing need to make things run efficiently. Um, so I'm very pleased to have my three co-panelists here to discuss this topic with me. And I'm gonna let them uh, introduce themselves and I will uh, maybe start with Ray at the far end. All right, thank you, Joe. Uh, it's an honor to be here uh, serving with Paul and Vikram and, and yourself, Joe, on this panel. Uh, my name is Ray Lu, CEO, co-founder of Vina Vitals. We are a early stage, seed stage startup uh, working on improving blood pressure monitoring. Uh, we make a small wearable device that allows you to uh, measure continuous beat to beat blood pressure, uh, basically like the arterial line, but without having to uh, stab the patient with a catheter uh, into the artery. Uh, currently in clinical validation stage, and um, also in addition to the, the venture studio model we have with Triple Ring, um, we're also backed by Y Combinator and MedTech Innovator. Thanks, Ray. Uh, Vikram? Awesome. Thanks, Joe. Um, thank, you, thank you all for, for coming. Thanks, Joe, for, uh, for having me here. Uh, I'm a principal with uh, General Ventures, which is an early stage uh, life sciences venture fund investing at the convergence of bio and tech. Uh, what that really means is, is effectively three uh, main verticals of investments, biology beyond healthcare, uh, biology as a technology and technology driving biology. And so MedTech firmly falls into, into that, that last bucket. Uh, we primarily invest at the, at the seed in Series A, so going in pretty early. And uh, you know, I, I'm excited to talk about uh, you know, sort of how venture studios intersect with, uh, with early stage venture and, and, uh, and really the partnership that that, that creates here. And Paul? Nice to be here. Um, so my name is Paul Conley. I'm the CEO of General Inception, which is a fairly recent um, example of a venture studio that was born out of my experience after almost 15 years as a, a garden variety venture capitalist focused on uh, science-based investing, what the kids today call deep tech. Uh, the majority of that at the intersection of physics and biology, so life science tools in particular. Um, the uh, venture capital firms that I've worked with over the years that have kind of been the inspiration of General Inception include Paladin Capital Group uh, out of Washington, D.C., more recently uh, Vertical Venture Partners, and I work very closely with uh, Vikram at Genoa uh, as a venture partner there as well. Thanks, Paul. I think I'll uh, kick off with a question to you, Paul. Um, uh, tell us what is a venture studio? What yeah, is what is, there. <laughs> yeah, what is general inception as yeah. a specific implementation 
And how has your particular model been informed by your experience as a traditional VC? Yeah, the, the inspiration for it, yeah. How long is this panel? 44 minutes, okay. <laughs> um, so uh, I think if we first define Venture Studio, because it may mean different things to different audiences, uh, it is um, primarily a model where the venture capital uh, you know, uh, personnel are directly involved in the formation of a company. So think about it, we think about it as uh, institutional co-founder. Um, the vocabulary, uh, I think, comes from the way that movies are made, hence the, the studio part of Venture Studio, where each movie is, an, is a sort of an episode unto itself where the right group of, of guilds or trades people get together to work on a project uh, and then they may end up reconfiguring on the next project and be sort of working with different groups of people uh, where the groups are very unique to the particular movie being made. So if you sort of translate some of that mental imagery to the early stage venture capital model, you get something venture studio-like. Um, it may be instructive to differentiate it from, from many, not all, incubators and accelerators uh, that tend to have some of the ingredients that you would find in a venture studio, at least our venture studio, and they might include infrastructure, space, access to equipment, um, access to EIRs or mentors, which usually are folks who come out of the commercial side of technology, um, and, uh, and sometimes a little bit of starter capital. And so at General Inception, uh, what we're doing includes all of those ingredients that you would hope to find in a great incubator accelerator, uh, or even some venture studios that existed before we started late, uh, early last year. Um, one of the essential ingredients that we think uh, sets General Inception apart is that in addition to being able to act as a professional co-founder or the business co-founder to great scientific founders, who haven't yet found the right business co-founder, we can also bring the proto-management team for the first 12 to 18 months where you can multiplex in uh, deep commercial talent across product, market, even sort of initial sales process. Um, but then also through partnering with a network of um, product development uh, groups, most especially Triple Ring Technologies, we're able to bring the translational resources together at inception. So all, all the ingredients. Uh, starter capital, say three to $500,000 in that range. Uh, the proto management team and the, the translational science and engineering team to take something from the bench and get it into the clinic or, or into customers' hands. Um, the inspiration for General Inception comes from the earliest days of my career as a VC going back to the, uh, the last decade, call it 15 years ago. And in the early stages, um, I had enough bandwidth uh, that operational leverage in my venture capital firm wasn't the limiter in terms of how deeply involved I could get with, with uh, entrepreneurs, uh, scientific founders. And I had a very formative experience where one of the early investments I made was in a company that didn't exist, we had to create it. We found some science out of Lawrence Livermore National Labs. Uh, we found some scientists that we had deep conviction, personal resonance, philosophical alignment. And later in my career, I would have seen that science and that team and said, I love what you guys are doing. Come back in a year, you're too early. And as my venture capital career evolved and developed a bigger and bigger portfolio, the amount of operating leverage that I had as a kind of a typical VC uh, became the limiting condition in being able to work with great science, great scientific founders to build great companies. That formative experience that I just described where we pulled a team into technology out of Lawrence Livermore Labs uh, was a company called Quantalife and they had invented droplet digital PCR. So I, I imagine anybody here who works at a, at a bench might recognize that product line. So that we, we created that. That founding team, by virtue of us being able to help them form Quantalife and be um, useful to them from the beginning to the end, is why when they started their next company, a uh, little company called 10X Genomics, uh, we got the first call and were able to go to a garage in Pleasanton for the birth of 10X Genomics. So this model, we think, is, is a 
right way to do it. And so general inception is kind of about recreating a, that magic uh, that we had with Quantalife and being able to be uh, effectively an institutional co-founder. And we'll get into more of that detail maybe elsewhere in the panel. Okay. Maybe Vikram, you're working at Genoa. You're a little downstream from where Paul starts. Um, has the way Genoa works evolved over the years to be more hands-on? And how are how is a group like Genoa working with other venture studios? And what are some of the interesting models out there that you've seen? Yeah. Thanks, Joe. Um, yeah, I mean, uh, I'll echo some of the, the commentary that, that Paul gave, which is, and, and just add one, uh, one more thing to that, which is it's not just about uh, being able to have the bandwidth to roll your sleeves up and work with one or two founders, but it's, it's that you see a multitude of great scientific founders who you can't service, possibly. You'll, and it's, it's almost like the first two that come through the door are the ones that you can work with in any given year, and you just can't work with everybody. And the ability to be able to have a partner upstream that can um, almost mold and curate, uh, you know, it, it's kind of like going from uh, kindergarten all the way to, you know, sort of getting into the early stages of, uh, you know, you're going in, in towards middle school. And then the early stage venture sort of picking you up at middle school and, and really teaching you more things and helping you grow up uh, as you go through further. That, that's sort of the kind of how we look at that relationship. And, and you know, companies are really, that, that's what it is, right? They're forged, you have to birth them. And so having an upstream partner like a venture studio that can do that is great. Uh, we've typically worked with a lot of incubators and accelerators historically uh, at Genoa. We spent, spent uh, some time there, but there's always uh, an element missing and you always have to end up, you know, trying to find and, and match them with, uh, with partners to actually do their productization work or, Find, you know, it takes a village to build a company, so you have to find all of the different resources, whether it's uh, regulatory resources, commercialization resources, and everything else all the way through. And that, that's where uh, a missing element of what we found, the venture studio model actually solves that. There's a few of them out there. Uh, in the therapeutic space, um, this model's been, been around for a little bit. Third Rock Ventures and Flagship uh, pioneering, both, both have done great work uh, in, in therapeutics uh, along there, but the quanta of capital required is, is quite significant, plus it's not as, as chimeric, right? You don't have to go through a commercialization journey, you don't have to have that mindset on there. Uh, in the pure tech space, things like Techstar have existed for, for some time as well that have done this, but the intersectional space of biology and technology, there, there's only been sort of some amount of work that's happened recently. Uh, there's another studio that's come up more, uh, a lot earlier that is, that is Initiate Studios, which is uh, doing a little bit of work in the med tech space primarily, also thinking about, uh, uh, about the uh, overall intersection of digital health and, and how, how that would work. But um, General Inception for us as a partner has been uh, unique, not just uh, obviously a big part of it is because of Paul, but uh, you know, a large part of it also is the, the concept of the model, just adding in and stitching together all the resources that exist in, in the ecosystem, but putting them under one umbrella. Uh, it, and, and so you're sort of getting a just-in-time build. Uh, and for us at Genoa, it becomes a, a great place for us to send the early scientific founders that we can't invest in yet, and, and also be able to partner with and, and advise on what would become an investable thesis at the seed or the series A. And so now all of a sudden you're getting not just an investment that's de-risked, but, an, but uh, entrepreneurs that have now had very high quality mentorship and, and you sort of know the, the process that they've gone through. It's kind of the same reason why sometimes people hire people from certain schools, right? It, it's, you know the pedigree of what, what's coming through and so you, you can trust the pedigree. There's also the advantage of being able to watch and stay in direct communication That's with right. the scientific founders for that six, nine, 12 months it takes to get them ready. Mm -hmm. Whereas certainly in, in my uh, venture career, you'd say, hey, go away and come back in a year. And then you sort of lose touch. So yeah. hopefully that's been a part of the value proposition, yeah. Ray, you, um, <clears throat> uh, you were involved in um, starting your company and spinning technology out of a university. And I know you've made the strategic decision to work extensively with partners. Um, 
what made you decide to to partner versus going it alone and trying to build everything from scratch? And and how do you see some of the trade-offs? Yeah, it's, it's a very good question. Uh, for us, you know, being an early stage startup, there's just um, limitless number of uh, things that you have to do to build your company, to be able to develop out your technology. And our instantiation of the Venture Studio model is with Triple Ring as a technology partner where um, we, we really saw three key benefits. And I, I would say the first is probably the most important is really just being able to have um, skin in the game and where you know, for, for us to know that uh, for Triple Ring, you're fully committed, you're fully vested, and uh, you know, for us to develop the technology, we're going to uh, come across numerous challenges and numerous de-risking of the technology that's necessary to get this product out. But uh, for you to be 100% committed and then um, know that, hey, you, you actually don't get paid until we are successful. And you know, that just, that skin in the game was very instrumental for us to be able to um, look at how we approach the re relationship and then be able to leverage that relationship. Um, and, and the second and third that also um, extend from that is really the, the second benefit is just the credibility because, and we leaned on this quite a lot because the credibility that you can say, uh, hey, you know, we have this uh, engineering firm who looked at our technology, evaluated it, and they know they can build it. Um, that goes a long way, uh, especially you know, last year when we were going through uh, YC and MedTech Innovator and talking to hundreds of investors. It, we really leaned that on that quite a lot, and it, it made a big difference in terms of our uh, ability to fundraise. Uh, and, and the last is, is just this expansion of your talent pool, because as a startup, you have different functions that you need to be able to develop, especially in the med tech space, uh, whether it's signal processing, your uh, electronics, your uh, firmware, all of these different aspects where you may, might not need a full, full-time resource, uh, and even going through that hiring process takes a long time. I mean, we might spend six months just to find a really good signal processing guide that, you know, that we're really happy with. And so, um, being able to work in this model with Triple Ring allows us to be able to leverage this um, vast experience talent network that allows us to spin up different resources for different types of projects. So I think in terms of the, you know, the, how we select the type of projects, we, you know, that, that process is basically we sit down, look at, okay, these are all the different need areas that we have. We can do these internally. Uh, these are the ones where we have gaps, and then we have this very collaborative dis discussion with our partner to be able to see, hey, where, where are you good at? Where do you think you can really help us de-risk? Where do we need to do it ourselves? And it becomes a very collaborative uh, approach. Yeah. Maybe my next question, I'll, I'll follow up and put this both to you, Ray, and Paul. What, what do you say to an entrepreneur who's embarking on starting a company from scratch, really wants to dig in and run it and lead it, who's afraid to partner in a, in a deep way with a venture capital firm um, because they don't want to lose control. What, what are the pluses and minuses? What's the best way for that entrepreneur to approach such a relationship? Can we jump in? Uh, sure. I, I, you know, from a startup perspective, it, it's really hard because I, I think most entrepreneurs, and, you know, and, and we're early stage, we're a seed stage, so a lot of uh, the audience here is even much further along than we are, but I would say that, you know, we all recognize that we can't do it alone. We all recognize that, hey, we're going to need help, but picking who's the, who, where are you going to be most efficient in getting that support and that help, I think that's the, the hardest part, and I think there it's just being able to weigh in, like, where are the biggest risk areas that you can de-risk, and and that's what I really like about the model is just that, you know, back to the skin in the game, because you know that they're, you know, they're dependent on your success for them to succeed. And so that, um, you know, hands down, anytime we have a skin in the game type of situation, we would prefer that over other models in terms of partnering. Yeah, I would say um, that whenever we're meeting a founder, particularly scientific founder, I'm almost always backing first time founders, certainly maybe founders who are maybe the CEO for the first time. So you're always trying to figure out in those first moments how to build trust. 
Um, and so oftentimes the entry point for us at General Inception is through one of the venture capital firms that we partner with uh, or that are sort of members of the venture studio. And the first moments are uh, trying to establish empathy. And for me, usually that's because I've been in their shoes. I've been a startup founder twice myself. And what we try to break apart or unpack is um, you know, what, uh, what it means to take venture capital. It's often explaining to a scientific founder uh, enough about how the business model of venture capital works so that they understand that it's, it's not that you can't trust it, you just have to understand it. And that once you take money from a venture capital, the clock starting and a bunch of other things. And what we're doing at General Inception is preparing them for that and jumping over to their side of the table in every way possible, certainly you know, emotionally with, with trying to build empathy there but legally and structurally. And so what we do is establish that if we do partner with a scientific founder, we'll uh, scope out and size the amount of capital and the amount of time required to get them to the point of being ready for venture capital. We'll, we'll size that in a way that by the time we've uh, transacted, we've sort of figured out what our uh, financial and, and legal deal is gonna look like, 100% of the time, it, it's a hard and fast rule for us, that scientific founder will be in control. They'll be in legal control, fiduciary control, voting control. And I do think that's a bit of a differentiator that's been helpful to us in uh, attracting great scientific founders who have seen other, uh, particularly venture studio models where at the outset, the deal is you are giving control over to the venture studio. That, that the venture capitalist in that venture studio is essentially saying, trust me, I will raise your baby and we'll send you a holiday greeting card you know, with a picture and an update. We're sort of doing the reverse of that and deeply aligning our interests so that we're, we're, we're giving them uh, the control that they deserve uh, and then sort of earning that right to be on the co-founder side of the table rather than the investor entrepreneur side of the table. And because uh, you know, my colleagues in the venture studio have spent so many years as VCs, we know what the terms are gonna look like. We know the kinds of things that our scientific co-founders need to be aware of. And when we're on their side of the table negotiating that first series seed or series A term sheet, um, you know, legally, financially, emotionally, we are co-founders about to go take on the responsibility of raising venture capital. I, I mean, I, I'll, I'll, I'll say one more thing, Paul, which is uh, the, Ability to, especially when, when you're trying to do an investment as, a, as an early stage venture capital with a first time founder, uh, it's a big leap of faith. It's an unknown quantity. You don't really know what they're going to look like. You don't know if in six months they're going to want to be running a company or not because starting a company and running a company is hard. Now, that's what makes our job possible, but it's extremely difficult. So having that ride along mentorship that helps you know, folks understand exactly what that is and, and placing different people in the right position. Sometimes scientific founders are the perfect CEO, and sometimes they're better off as being the head of technology or head of product, but not the CEO. Right. And, and I think that that, that but, but you don't know that until you do the, the early part of that, that incubation period with, with something like a venture studio and having somebody who's sort of constantly looking as they're, as they're growing up and learning what shape they are uh, inside of the company is really important, and it, it, it again, that's the biggest part of backing a first-time, uh, you know, founder uh, in in a company, and that 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 that's the part that that is most exciting about. Like, you know, if I was a founder, uh, which I have been in the past, that would be the most exciting part of like working with uh, with a venture studio would be would be that aspect of things. So yeah, and we, as you know, I mean, we we take the approach that every scientific founder deserves the right to decide what they're going to be in their own company. Um, and we go into these things taking a leap of faith that we and they will be intellectually honest about figuring out what shape they are. Uh, so we're knowingly taking a risk that some scientific founders will uh, want to be the CEO. And we're like, okay, well, you're the CEO and let's figure out how to, how to develop you into that. I actually quite enjoy that. Uh, but it is always a bit of a risk, a bit of a leap of faith to see uh, when the scientific founder uh, um, can, can grow or, or 
create other muscles that even they didn't know they had. That, that's always fun, but it's always a bit exhilarating to say the least to see yeah. whether that's gonna happen and how self-aware they are if that isn't happening and the sort of how we go and build you know, a team around them. Uh, but I think it, it, it's sort of um, uh, the bane of traditional venture capital is that sort of CEO question with first time founder uh, CEOs. We, we kind of embrace it rather than try to run away from it. Maybe, excuse me, maybe Ray, a question for you. Um, you mentioned Y Combinator and some other groups you've worked with. Um, can you comment on the range of resources that are available out there to an early stage med tech entrepreneur? Um, what are the great things to take advantage of? And then conversely, what are the things that you think absolutely need to belong inside a company where you, you just can't partner that out? Sure. Yeah, we've had the, the benefit of, um, really, we, we benefited quite a bit from uh, several different ex accelerators, uh, Y Combinator, MedTech Innovator, uh, as well as um, with Triple Ring, the, the model that we have. It, and it really is a diverse set that we went out there and, and picked out the aspects that were really relevant for us. Or, you know, and each accelerator has their core strengths and, and benefits, and for us, uh, you know, YC was really about fundraising and being able to um, get out there and access that network. With uh, MedTech Innovator, it was really about the strategics and being able to um, have mentors uh, amongst the strategics to be able to help us along the way uh, and, and triple ring from the engineering perspective. So I think, you know, there's, you know, what, what you want to keep as a, as a startup is really, you, you want to be able to maintain control from the, the, pers from the pers perspective of, hey, you know, what's your goal for this, your vision and goal for the company? And I don't think anybody's there to try to take it away from you. So um, you, you want to be able to convey that so that you can find the partners who also believe in that vision and are willing to partner with you along the way in that vision. And I think, you know, there's, every startup is so different, right? You know, you, you have, such unique situations with each one, and it could be one that you know. Hey, the CEO wants to focus on building their their technology, and they don't want to do all the other things, and um, and vice versa. You know, they come in all shapes and sizes. So I think it's very much a unique, uh, you know, case by case evaluation of what you want to keep internal versus what you want to partner. Because at, at the end of the day, ultimately, you, everybody, every, everyone at the table is trying to aligned towards the same goals, as long as you can ensure that you're aligned towards that, then um, you know, how you set it up, what's internal, what's external, uh, I, I would say doesn't actually matter too much as long as you're achieving your goals. Maybe uh, Vikram and Paul will give you each a crack at the second half of that question. Are there things you would advise an early stage founder to absolutely hang on to himself or herself and not partner that? Are there some things you just you just have to do inside the company. Hmm. Um, are you talking about in terms of the work that needs to be done or, or uh, yeah. legal control, those sorts of things? Or, yeah. Any yeah, way you want to answer uh, the yeah. question? Um, well, I, I kind of alluded to one of uh, my answers to that earlier in that I think that um, it took me a while uh, as a VC to have the epiphany that the constraint in the equation isn't money. Uh, as much as most founders um, think raising money is very, very difficult, there's so much, there's too much money in the system. There's not enough, you know, truly great scientific founders who are doing, you know, game-changing things that could be the basis of um, game-changing companies. And once I, I sort of pivoted my thinking to understand that, there's an awful lot that those founders know about the opportunity and how to go attack it that, if I'm honest about it, I don't know. I bring a lot of value as, as a sort of financial partner and now sort of professional co-founder. But the point is, is I think uh, the founders should maintain control of their company. And the idea is to figure out a way to partner with them so that they're getting good advice, but ultimately are making the decisions. And, uh, and so I would counsel founders after being the VC who's you know, always seeing how much control I can get of something, to just maintain control, especially at the early stages, maintain, maintain control of, of, of the who, you know, the what, uh, and just choose wisely you know, the capital and the um, human resources that you start to accumulate around you to go build 
uh, what you're excited about building. In terms of the scope of work to keep internally, my experience has been uh, great scientific founders um, tend to, uh, like all human beings, uh, find their people, sort of find their tribe. And it's more likely that a great scientific founder has a social graph replete with people on the short list for the Nobel Prize than it is people who are great assay developers or mechanical engineers. Uh, and so I think uh, I always counsel founders pull that tribe in that's going to monopolize a particular insight and understanding about the problem you're trying to solve and the applications of that. And the other stuff, don't, don't try to reinvent that wheel. Partner, uh, especially over the first couple of years, to do that. Maybe, Vikram, I'll ask you um, to follow up on that question. What should a CEO or a founder keep to him or herself? Or I'll even take it a step further. What kind of founder or what sort of situation um, would lead you to say you shouldn't work with a venture studio? You should go it alone. Yeah, um, uh, uh, so I, I guess it's a two-parter. I, I think on the first part, echo Paul's point and uh, about wanting to be in control of the vision for your company because at the end of the day as, as a venture capitalist and this is something that you have to uh, make sure it, for those of us that have been operators in the past have to sort of shy away from this is you're investing in the thesis of the founders not in your own thesis for the business yeah and 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 it's really it's really hard sometimes to, to, to tear those two things apart. Because Investing you, in your own plan is, yeah. this, is this VC rather than the founder's vision. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> and, and so I Been think there, it's, it's really important to have a clear plan, and that's your plan that, that you have to in, be in control of. And the other thing is just about your differentiation, right? What makes you special? What's your special sauce? And it could be that the, the engineering of uh, a box that you're making is not, it, it's, is important but not unique to you uh, to the extent. But the secret sauce is the assay, or vice versa, right? And, and you need to sort of figure out what is your big differentiating factor and always be in control of that for as long as you can. It doesn't mean you can't partner those out, but you have to be in control of that product vision and the, and the specifics of that. Um, I think venture studios um, have an amazing role, for, for, particularly for first-time founders, for founders who, frankly, want to focus on product vision and development of their product. They, they want to focus on science development. Uh, and they really don't want to deal with you know, the, the issues of how do I build up my back office infrastructure? What do I do for building up my business processes? How do I make sure that my company actually operates on an ongoing basis and, and the trains run on time right inside the company, uh, especially at the early stages? If you don't want any of those things, Venture Studio is perfect for you. But if that's what gets you jazzed up in the morning and that's what makes you want to, want to be a founder is you want to know where everybody's desk is and how far away it is from, from the doors and you know, what, the, what the plan is in terms of an evacuation. I mean, there's people like that. I mean, I'm one of those people, right? I love the business operations part of, of, of work. And in that case, you know, maybe the venture studio isn't your best bet, particularly if you've done it three, four, five times and you already have a vast network of folks to do that with. And that's not to say that a serial entrepreneur shouldn't ever partner with it, but it's a personal decision to be made of the value proposition that the venture studio is giving you and allows for you to not have to deal with. Is that worth it for you or not? And that, that value proposition is something that you need to sort of absorb and understand. Is Do you get to do, wake up in the morning and do more of the things that you love to do, which is why you're an entrepreneur? If the answer is yes, and the Venture Studio enables that, absolutely do it. If the answer is no, don't do it, right? Because it's about happiness. <clears throat> yeah, and, and just to add to that, I, I think you know, some startups will fit very well in that type of model where they want to outsource the, the non-technical uh, aspects. But for, for other startups, it's not to say that other startups, the ventures model, Venture Studio model might not work well. For, for us, for example, it is really about the being able to outsource some of the engineering aspects where we, and to your point, Vikram, we definitely don't want to give uh, the sensor work out to a, a third party just because 
you know, that's our core technology, that's our IP. We, and regardless, we need to develop that ourselves. So whether, um, you know, that, that expertise needs to be developed in-house and we need to train ourselves on that and, and become really proficient at that. But some of the other, you know, the box that you mentioned, um, that box can be done externally a lot more efficiently than it can internally. And so that would be a perfect candidate for us to be able to say, hey, this electronics module, we don't necessarily need to have this be, uh, you know, do, learn our own miniaturization of this module and, and own all of that. There's plenty of partners to be able to work with. So, um, so, so yeah, I, I think in our scenario, definitely picking out those aspects where they're still mission critical, they're going to be on your critical path as well, but you, they're, they're not part of your core, uh, you know, proprietary, your, I guess, you, the core of who you want to be as a startup and, and uh, you know, what you want to own. I think those are the aspects that are really good candidates to look for partners for efficiency. That seems to be an opening to, to maybe ask you a question, Joe, if I may be so bold. <laughs> uh, how has Triple Ring, uh, evolved its model of working with particularly really early stage startups? Because I know Triple Ring has a, a wide range of clients, some mature, some, you know, literally formation stage. And what have you found around sort of how out outsourcing has worked for you guys? Yeah. Um, thanks for turning a question around. Uh, <laughs> I thought I was escaping from this panel, but... Uh, I'm here for you. <laughs> I, we, we've done two things. Uh, when we work with early stage companies, we think two things are really important. One is make sure that they can maintain the core expertise internally. That's their secret sauce. And I, I think you guys already addressed that. Um, the other thing we've done with our model is move from just a fee for service, uh, pay as you go model to a skin in the game model where we really try hard to align risk and reward. And um, I'm saying that's not as a sales pitch for us, but just as an advice to anyone in the audience who's going to work with a, a third-party development firm. I, I think um, the key to a successful project to is share that risk and award and align incentives. And um, that means having your development partner take some risk, but also means making sure they don't take too much risk. I, I think a lot of people approach the fee-for-service model and think they're paying to transfer the risk to the development partner, and, and that just doesn't work. So we, we've tried to find business models that really align incentives. Well, the experience that I know the general inception companies have had who have um, been lucky enough to work with tripling is that this vocabulary of co-development comes up a lot, like outsourcing very different co-development. There's a sort of notion that uh, the the client, in this case, maybe a general inception portfolio company, should and needs to develop a certain amount of its own in-house capability, and the goal is for that to mature alongside Triple Ring. And, and for the venture studio model, the goal is to get them to where they have their own teams, not not to yeah. not have their own teams, but to 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 get there in a healthy way. Yeah, we actually like to see our client companies add their own people as right. they grow, add people as they need them. And you know, one of our uh, value adds is sometimes helping them recruit their own team. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I that's... Maybe I can switch gears here a little bit. I know a lot of people in the audience are out. Uh, trying to raise seed series A, series B. Um, I know that one of the benefits of a venture studio is helping the companies raise follow-on money. Are there some, can you talk about how you help, some secrets you can share? Um, one of the things that's really, really struck me was I know, um, Paul, you tee up deals with venture capitalists um, way in advance yeah. when you're planning to do a round. And I was in the panel discussion just before lunch when some of the folks talking about corporate M&A and partnering said they like to see things early. So maybe talk about how you tee up a deal with a venture group and is it ever too early to go and how, Yeah. what's uh, your advice to the folks raising rounds of capital out here? Well, I mean, one of the advantages you 
should get from a venture studio model if you partner with a venture studio is early and direct access to the customer, which is downstream venture capital firms. And so, as I mentioned in describing my inspiration for General Inception was to solve my own problem as a, as a VC. And uh, not surprisingly, a lot of the syndicate partners that I would co-invest with in first rounds have the same problem, including Genoa. <laughs> and so uh, in some sense, we've created General Inception to solve that problem for an ecosystem of VCs who are naturally syndicating deal flow and syndicating investments and you know, building companies uh, together. And so that's um, created a nice you know, balanced equation where whenever we do uh, form a company with a scientific founder, we're doing that sort of in concert with this group of VCs that we work with uh, frequently. And that group is constantly growing as uh, more in our network find out about what we're doing. So informally, uh, we are always exposing the companies, at least what they're doing, to the VCs. And we're getting some market check from those VCs that are part of our, uh, our ecosystem around, hey, if we spent nine months, 12 months checking these boxes, is this likely to fit with your portfolio thesis and an area that you're keenly interested in? If yes, will you stay in touch? Let these you know, evolving companies come give you an update quarterly until they're ready. And in that way, you're sort of meeting the market rather than sitting in a cave for a year and then hoping that your 12 slide PowerPoint deck hits the mark when you emerge. So we, we've taken that approach of sort of deeply integrating with the ecosystem of VCs rather than simply making an introduction and hope it works out. Uh, Vikram, I know you've um, uh, run a venture studio within a large corporate. And I, I know there are folks in the audience who are from the corporate side. Uh, is there anything you want to say about this venture model, um, about how corporates can take advantage of it, or, or perhaps even implement their own, as you've done in the past? Yeah, yeah. I, I think the um, the you know almost any corporate that wants to take advantage of early stage innovation, you know, there's always this push and pull between a, a couple of things. Right. One is if you're doing it in your own core core area. The, the push and pull is always about, do I want to uh, build it or buy it, right? It's the build versus buy. And, and if you talk to your R&D teams inside, they will always believe that they can build it better than anybody else uh, will externally. So why would you spend the money on the M&A, right? Uh, but there's a speed component to it that, that is helpful. There's also a component to, you know, there's certain projects around risk profile that just fall below the waterline inside of a corporate. And you just... You just can't, it, it is just impossible for you to pay attention to, again, limited bandwidth, even in large corporates, of do every single one of the projects that you want to do. And so the value of having a venture studio external is that you can actually take advantage of spinning out technologies, capabilities that might be, might fall below the waterline for your internal bandwidth and, and attention but if they were to develop and get to a certain point in time, they all of a sudden now fit inside of a roadmap that you're doing. And this could be as much as like small amount of product development, or it could be a, a full-on product line. And sometimes you don't know the answer to that, but, but there's a lot of great innovation that sort of sits inside corporates for that. Having done this you know, inside of a corporate, and, I, and when I did it, I did it in a non-core area. Um, that was even harder. And for, for those of us that uh, have worked in a corporate and have tried to do innovation not core to your business, you know what I'm talking about, is it's exciting until it's not. And then the core inertia of the, of the business decides that this is no longer going to be attention and you're constantly competing against that, those resources. And so if you ever want to explore opportunities that are not exactly core to your business, uh, being able to do it and incubate ideas through a partnership in certain verticals with a venture studio, is actually, which is external to you, is actually perfect. Because that allows you to do the exploration, but not have to have a commitment of like hiring people and going through all that process. And, and you're sort of, you have the freedom of innovation in some ways. Thanks. Um, we have just about five minutes left. And I want to give the audience an opportunity to ask questions. I think there's a microphone back there. 
I think there's a question up here in the front. Hi, Brian Hakim of Metech X. Uh, when do you kick them out of the nest, if you do? And also, do you, if is there ever a uh, disagreement between whether one of your companies should take your resource versus go external? If they, you know, for in your example, for if you want to go outside and they want you, they have the capabilities inside and they want you to take that. I, I can cover that real quick. Actually, um, we definitely had those situations. We went external because we felt Triple Ring didn't have the expertise or we could do it better externally. And this comes back to, hey, well, it's in Triple Ring's best interest as well because rather than slow us down, uh, you know, we could do, and, and they were competing, they were actually, they had teams that could compete to do this, but we felt somebody else could do it better. Um, and so it's easy for us to make that decision. And I guess it also relates back to the control uh, aspect of it and, and the type of relationship you set up. You, you still want the startup nimbleness to be able to make those types of decisions. Yeah. When do the birds need to fly, Paul? Yeah, yeah well, it tends to be uh, resource limited. Um, we've set ourselves up so that we don't end up you know, competing with the VCs that are in our midst. And so there is a point at which uh, you know, financially, they need to raise that money from someplace else. So there is no hard limit that says by a certain period of time, you know, like we're done. Uh, and we, you know, we pick up the pledge and we have a meaningful equity stake. So we're heavily incentivized to, to get a, a successful financing done at the other end of you know, phase one of the journey or the end of the beginning, however you want to look at that. Um, and we uh, have a hard limit on a million dollars. Like I said earlier, we typically start with three to $500,000, but things take longer. And so we'll, uh, our policy is that if more money is needed to cross that first chasm, we will do that investment on uh, convertible notes or something that doesn't change the voting dynamics, which goes back to the question about uh, what if there's a disagreement about what resource to, to use? And I'll say it again, it is their company. It is our ethos, and it's what we put in practice. So we have wonderful partners, Triple Ring being a great one, uh, but it's always the scientific founder's decision. We sort of show them the tools, we tell them what we think, uh, we expose them to all of the other uh, entrepreneurs in the general inception portfolio and everyone that we've ever worked with, then they kind of decide, you know, do I trust the judgment and advice? But it's always advice. We're consigliaries. We're not in the driver's seat. And that's exactly where we want to be. Consigliaries, not in the driver's seat. And it's amazing that with that type of um, approach, uh, I can't think of one bad decision, knock wood, <laughs> that our scientific founders have made. They're smart. They know what they're doing. I think we have time for maybe one more question. In the back. Do you guys have a consistent um, scorecard to provide quantitative feedback to the founders um, across the board? So um, you have some sort of consistent backdrop to evaluate the, the various companies across the, the different specialties that they're in? We do not, is the short answer. Uh, I think that's because at the earliest stages, every, one, every scientific founder and every project is so different. I'd also say that we're you know, uh, on our second year of doing this, and so I don't think we've gotten to a place where there's enough of a baseline you know, to do that scoring, but it's absolutely on our roadmap as the whole purpose around general inception is to create sort of some industrial scale around company formation, which means process consistency. So your question is a great one. I hope to see you next year. You can answer it. Ask it again. <laughs> okay, maybe the, the last 30 seconds here, and then we want to end right at seven minutes past the hour. But Paul or Vikram, why aren't all VCs running their own venture studios within their funds? <laughs> Well, um, it's a little bit like when you buy a car and all of a sudden you see that car on the road constantly. I feel like 
uh, in the last uh, couple of years, uh, the number of our colleagues that mm -hmm. are doing a venture studio model of some form or fashion is growing geometrically. And I think more VCs like us have come to the conclusion that if you're gonna be an early stage investor, uh, doing that safe note, whatever, is not the way to do it. Get involved and, uh, and be part of Inception. And so uh, I think we're gonna see a lot more of it. Okay. Well, I want to thank all of you for coming down, coming to our conference in person. Uh, I want to thank LSI for the uh, opportunity to be on this panel and put it together and for the excellent work they do in putting this conference together. And I want to thank you all for your attention. Thanks. Thank you.